Welcome to the Transport Decarbonization Alliance Fireside Chat, the TDA's unique collaboration of countries, cities, and companies, or as we like to say, the three C's, working to accelerate the worldwide transformation of the transport sector towards a net zero emission mobility system before 2050. In this series, we sit down with colleagues representing diverse members of our alliance to learn more about what their country, city, region, or company is doing to move the needle on transport decarbonization. Okay, welcome back everybody to a, another edition of this Fireside Chat series we've been putting on with members of the Transport Decarbonization Alliance. Uh, today I'd like to wel welcome Ellen Greenberg, who is the Deputy Director for Sustainability at the California Department of Transportation. We're very happy to have you here with us, Ellen, as you know, it's always exciting to talk about what's happening in California. So we're really grateful you could join us and, and you know, we're, I hope we have a, a great time chatting together. Thank you, Chris, glad to join. Happy to be part of this effort. Thanks a lot. So I wanna start this, this little fireside chat with a quick question, mostly about yourself. I wanna, we wanna know more about you, Ellen, because you've been so instrumental, I think, in really bringing California to the forefront in the TDA and, and, and really pushing um, a lot of activities with us and it's been it's been great having you aboard so can you tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of the work you've been doing in sustainable development and climate change you know when did you really start being engaged in this kind of work and and what was that moment maybe in your career where you realized that you know transport decarbonization is really so important for our future and really fighting mm -hmm. climate change uh, okay, well, I'm going to be like most good interviewees and answer a question you didn't ask. <laughs> so, um, so I'm an, I'm an urban planner by profession. And uh, I'm going to talk about a different moment in my career that was a pivotal moment for me. So most of my career I spent in consulting, um, though I did uh, the very start of my career in the 1980s. I worked in state government in New York State, and now, much later in my career, I'm working in state government in California. Uh, but most of my career, I worked in consulting, and I uh, started with a firm that did mostly uh, master planning for municipal government. So city-scale planning for mid-sized, small cities and towns, um, looking maybe 20 years into the future. And the, um, you know, the real moment that, that came, for, came at me uh, was when I realized that there was a focus on talking about transportation through people's concern about congestion and traffic delay. And that concern was getting in the way of people's talking about uh, the future of their communities. And I wanted to be able to redirect the conversation towards a conversation that was more, um, more of a comprehensive view of uh, community future. And that's what made me decide to uh, get a degree in civil engineering as well as a degree in um, urban and regional planning and work at the kind of at the you know intersection of these different fields. And so my work really for decades has been interdisciplinary. And I think um, that plus uh, my love for urban environments, plus my uh, you know basic concern about resource conservation, land conservation and preservation, um, and this multidisciplinary perspective really brought me more than, uh, you know, more than a, a focus on decarbonization, sure. you know, brought me into sustainability. Yeah, and I mean, this whole systems thinking systems approach is really a key element of how you achieve sustainable development, at least when we talk about it in the global policy processes that we engage in, um, you know, systems thinking is so key to it, because you need a bit of, like you were saying, multidisciplinary, right, you need a little bit of everybody, in a sense, all the professionals, um, all people together to really kind of achieve that. And you're not going to do it just by talking about one specific element of transport decarbonization. It, it needs really a whole of society approach, all kinds of people with specialties and expertise. So that's really interesting to hear. And so you're saying, so the transport part of it came a bit later in your career, right? Like really getting into the oh. transport part of it. <laughs> right. It really did. And I, um, my undergraduate education was in geography, which is also, you know, really fundamentally a, kind of a, an integrated uh, discipline that really looks at so many different issues through a spatial 
uh, a spatial perspective. And of course, uh, geography has gotten, I would say, much, much more popular over the course of my career as we have deepened our technical ability to use spatial tools and spatial analysis. So, um, you know, and now I think digging deeply with our spatial tools to better understand equity issues, to better understand, you know, health issues um, and the impacts of positive and negative of our transportation systems. Wow, super interesting. Thank you. So let's shift a bit now to California, because I think that's really the, the star of our discussion, right? And in many ways, California has been really a true leader when it comes to transport decarbonization issues in the US, um, whether it has to do with decarbonizing trucks and freight vehicles or transforming passengers transportation. Of course, California is a massive, massive place. Um, what is it, 55 million people now? <laughs> no, we're not. We're not up above 50 million yet. We're in the, in the 40s. I think that's current uh, current population between 40 million and 45 million. Right. So something crazily huge like that, right? A country in its own right, right? But still, like in terms of this issue of transport decarbonization, that issues that the issue that really matters to us in the TDA and, and in this sector, California has been a leader. So I really want to give you the opportunity now to to summarize some of these achievements, some of this work. Um, you know, what makes California such a front runner, not just in North America, but in the TDA itself? Okay, um, so appreciate the opportunity. This may be kind of a lengthy answer because there are a lot of different aspects of this. Sure. Um, I think the reality is that the history of California's activism in the climate and decarbonization area is rooted in our history on the air quality front. And our history on the air quality front really comes from having bad air quality <laughs> and an activist, you know, an active state response to, uh, you know, the world famous smog uh, in the Los Angeles basin, in the San Joaquin Valley, which is the central inland valley uh, of California. Um, and, you know, having the early experience of recognizing the connection between auto emissions and and smog. And I will say that one of the great things about living in California across the decades is really understanding the long-term efficacy of those regulations um, of, of uh, emission standards. And you know, I had the, I have grown children. Um, I had the experience of being uh, with my children and my husband in the Los Angeles area and admiring, you know, some mountain views. And my husband who lived in Southern California uh, decades and decades and decades ago, you know, saying that when he was a kid, those mountains were not visible. <laughs> and so, you know, we have seen, uh, we've seen the benefits of regulation in terms of, of public health and environmental quality. And I, you know, what I see in terms of the changing attitudes towards these policies is how important it is to keep, uh, you know, keep the public, keep younger generations of professionals and the public aware of the fact that the, the quality, the air quality we have now, I mean, we're still working, obviously, we still have, you know, we're not at the point we want to be, there are still impacted areas and impacted people. Um, but we, we have, are seeing and experiencing a lot of benefit from decades of attention to this issue. So um, we have a pretty complex state government and our role in air quality regulation and uh, vehicle regulation um, really was initiated before the federal government passed, the US federal government passed the Clean Air Act amendments in 1970. So most of the air pollution control policy across the country was started with the Clean Air Act amendments. At that point though, California was granted a special position, a waiver to the state to enact its own regulations. Right. And that waiver has been critical because through that waiver, California has actually been out ahead and um, imposed and enforced regulations more vigorous than the regulations imposed at the federal level in most cases. This is actually not my area of expertise. I wanna to point to that. That has uh, happened through the work of the California Air Resources Board, 
Um, and some of the Air Resources Board staff has worked with us as part of our, our TDA kind of community within state government. So for folks who want to learn more about that, there's a lot about the history of our vehicle uh, fuel and emissions regulations on the Air Board's website. So I'll point folks there for more information. So um, the Air Resources Board continues to be key in this work. Um, they prepare the state's climate strategy, which is called the scoping plan. And the climate change scoping plan is uh, being will be updated in 2021. We're now working with the 2017 climate change scoping plan. And that is that's our mitigation plan, really. And there is a you know separate effort around adaptation and and resilience. So uh, that work uh, regulating fuels and regulating um, you know catalytic converters and check engine lights and inspection and maintenance program, all of those different aspects. Um, or through the Air Resources Board and through that federal waiver. And then in 2012, the Advanced Clean Car Regulation came in to coordinate uh, GHG and smog-reducing standards. Uh, so, you know, those are two big pieces, um, you know, pieces of the work. So now we're on to looking at decarbonization. Um, and the state has a goal of uh, decarbonization by 2045. And uh, I have had an opportunity to look at um, just at the very end of, of the year to look at a draft of a study trying to kind of lay out the pathway to a carbon neutral transportation system. So the state has been partnering with some of our um, academic institutions in the state to do this work that, you know, how can this happen? What's the, what is the transportation? sector pathway, uh, to what extent does that rely on new investments, new regulation or policy? Um, and that's looking at, um, you know, the vehicle sector and fuel sector, and as well as uh, looking at vehicle miles traveled or VKT um, and auto use. And, and my, in my professional interest for a long time has been on that side of things really um, looking at how we can move away from the level of auto dependency in a lot of communities towards a higher level of active transportation, towards more efficient automobile trips. So not necessarily, you know, no one's driving, but how can we support more efficient and higher occupancy uh, travel when we are, um, you know, taking trips that make sense by driving or when we're households that rely on driving for whatever reason. So that kind of investigation into the pathway is something that's ongoing, ongoing now. Sure. Um, the one other, sorry, if, if I'm not going on too much, the one other entity at state government I want to mention is the California Energy Commission. So the Energy Commission uh, is leading a few relevant efforts here. One is to um, address the issue of integrating electric vehicle charging needs with the electric grid and our clean vehicle program, kind of how that, you know, lines up. Um, and they're looking more broadly, they are also responsible for doing the um, charging infrastructure planning for the state. So they're another another partner. Yeah, and, and, and I was gonna bring that up if you hadn't already done it, because I remember the last time we saw one another before the pandemic, I think it was the Transport Research Board of 2020. So right before everything kind of changed, right? Um, there was a number of presentations by, by California officials and others about this kind of integration with charging stations and all that. Um, <clears throat> and you know that you know electrification is a big part of this kind of transformation of transport kind of a lot of the work that people in the TDA, members of the TDA are doing in their own kind of strategies towards 2050. Um, and so electrification I know is also key for California. I want to ask you something now about yeah. California kind of being, you know, the first North American member of the TDA. I mean, the TDA is not that old, you know, it's only been what, three years now since we were really born as a platform, as an alliance. Uh, and, and I think it's really important that we continue to engage regional governments, right? Um, so the question for you is, as, as I think now the almost the only, still the only regional official of regional government in, in the TDA, where do you see, um, what benefits do you think governments like California 
or other regional governments can derive from membership in the TDA? What is it about the TDA that helps California maybe in kind of understanding its role in, in global pro policy processes? Um, what is it about it that, that has been useful for you um, and could be useful for other regional government representatives like yourself? So that was a number of questions balled together. So I'll, I'll give a number of responses. You can try to hit them on, so, the, on the nose one at a time, right? So yeah, I mean, one, one thing is that the state is committed to working with partners internationally and does that in a number of different forums. And of course, um, you know, our, our, our climate goals can only be achieved at a global scale. And even if we meet our objectives uh, as a state, that's not enough. So there's a lot of incentive and a lot of reason to work together. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to work with the TDA because of the focus on transportation, whereas many of the states, you know, uh, alliances and partnerships in the climate zone are, are more general. Um, but also, uh, while we do have some activity that's related specifically for example, to um, to the vehicle transition, I appreciate that broader uh, emphasis on mobility, on meeting people's needs in the transportation sector, and on recognizing the value of active transportation um, as as part of the picture and part of the solution. So, you know, I've been really pleased to work with the uh, TDA, uh, the individuals representing the TDA, because I feel like that broader perspective is quite common. Now, one thing I think that maybe is um, is unique to us because of the size of the state government that's been a real advantage, uh, maybe an unintended positive consequence is that because of our membership, we have gathered as a group within state government to connect in order to coordinate with the TDA. So there's actually been an internal benefit because we've brought together um, our administration partners to talk about our membership, to connect people to uh, other members internationally who can support or exchange information about leading practices or you know what people are doing. So that has been a uh, an unanticipated positive consequence. Actually, bring us together in our own in our own uh, government. Yeah, that that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, we never. Of course, I know California is part of a number of different platforms, alliances, what have you. But, but the fact that transport is only—I get you—I guess you only really get your interest fulfilled in the TDA, right? Because it's the one that is spe sector specific, um, whereas the others, like you said, are more general. Because I know there's a number of different organizations out there that are trying to push uh, climate change priorities and sustainability priorities in the U.S. But it's interesting to know that in the U.S., I think the TDA is probably the only one that could provide that transport specific. Well, I think especially when you look at the at the active transportation together uh, with the zero emission vehicle and decarbonization emphasis, because we are, you know, we do have international uh, organizations that are focused on the zero emission vehicles and on the vehicle transition. Um, but, you know, my my angle and of course since we are the owner operators of the state highway system it's right. about far more uh it's about far more than just the vehicles yeah and, and that's a good point of bringing up the, the the highway system right because having regional governments and, and subnational governments in the tda i think i mean in many ways the governments you represent have so much ability to make a change because of just the sheer number of roads um, especially in the U.S., right? So many roads are, are controlled by the, the State Department of Transportation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and having those kinds of people, those kinds of folks who are engaging in the global work or, or engaging the TDA really can allow for some kind of catalyst for change um, because we know that people like you are really have so much impact around how you can manage the decarbonization of your, of your state, of your city, of your municipality, what have you. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is something that we need to really promote, seeing how California is a key, not just a key member of the TDA, and not just one of the, the only regional members of the TDA, but it's California. It's just a massive place. Um, and so I think there's a lot to learn from in, in terms of your experience in the TDA, and then how we can kind of use that to pull in uh, more regional governments to join us in our work. Mm -hmm. Well, you are, you're perhaps crediting me with more authority than I actually hold, but I do think 
I do think that it's interesting that actually the discussion of the role of the operators of the civil infrastructure of the roadways is is infrequent. It, it, it's not that often that we actually address that we have these assets that are exceptionally valuable and exceptionally important. Um, and that when we're talking about climate, often, again, the, the owner operator role is kind of left out. Um, but one of the focuses that is really emerging for us in California is a focus on our investment decisions. And I'd say at long last, a real emerging recognition that, you know, what we build influences people's travel behavior, that there is a feedback loop, that the availability of capacity influences how much people uh, how much people drive obviously influences our land development patterns, um, and that our our history, uh, which is a history of building capacity in response to demand, um, you know, is now something that we're looking at very differently. It's not just because of the climate uh, consequences or the environmental consequences. It's also because of the cost of maintaining an asset if the asset keeps growing. Um, and our revenue streams are not are not growing in proportion. It makes me also think of the phenomenon of induced demand, right? Like for mm -hmm. so long in the U.S., especially planners were just like, well, we just need to build more roads or you know more highways, and that will make all this congestion go away. And we learned that the opposite is true, right? Um, it's really interesting to read about that. I mean, my, I mean, I'm I'm not new to the transport sector anymore, but my work before was always in sustainable development. But then focusing just on transport, you learn so much about how so much planning may have gone wrong in the past. And in reality, like quick fixes could actually change a lot of things. Um, so it's right. good to hear that. So we are, yeah, so we are, um, you know, that, that phenomenon of induced demand, which is, you know, the behavioral response to a, a lower cost, right? Or lower travel time or prove reliability. You know, that is now the focus of our analysis of, of the impact the transportation impact of uh, investments in our highway system. So that is a change that I've been working on directly with, with colleagues um, in other parts of state government. And that's a huge change. Just recognizing that phenomenon is, and naming it, you know, is very new for a lot of folks in the department. It's a real paradigm shift because I mean, I, I'm from New York City. That's where I am. It's where I've been quarantining. Um, you know, even people like in New York who use a lot of public transport who don't necessarily drive very often, that paradigm shift, that mental shift still hasn't even hit many people who don't drive that often. You know, you know, we don't think about how a lot of what we have in terms of our road systems are actually not encouraging us to drive less. They're encouraging mm -hmm. us to drive more in some way. Um, and, and people don't realize that it really does require a bit of a mental shift. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a difficult struggle, but I think you know, with, with people in leadership who understand it, we can actually see that change, see that shift. Um, you know, because in places like New York where we have the vision zero, right? Um, right? We're trying to limit, you know, we're trying to increase road safety by limiting speed limits and, and doing something about, you know, just safety on the road in general to protect passengers and to protect pedestrians and others. Um, for a while, people were complaining nonstop. And now we're seeing, like you mentioned before, we're seeing the benefits of these policies and regulations. And suddenly everyone's happy about it. But in the beginning, you know, constant complaints. Um, but these these are deliberate deliberate regulations and deliberate policies that have actual, you know, thought and science and history behind them. So it's really important to get things going. So I, right, and I think yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I, well, I was just going to say, um, you know, safety is always the top priority of our department, and. You know, a, a further consideration is that, you know, when, in terms of our long term goals, but when we have a system, uh, you know, if we succeed in bringing down vehicle miles traveled, you know, it is a fundamental contributor to congestion. It is a, a contributor to uh, collision rates. And so bringing that down, you know, we're having challenges now during the pandemic with speeds. So, you know, the, the various components are, are related in, I think, in fairly complex ways. But yeah. in terms of our aspiration to bring down uh, auto dependency and hopefully to reallocate uh, roadway space in some contexts, 
to active transportation or to uh, dedicated transit capacity. You know, all those things should also, uh, in the long term, contribute to a safer environment. Yeah, and I just wanted to 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 go into a, a bit of a different matter now, uh, mm -hmm. definitely related to to California's work in the CDA. Um, but just to to ask you about recent trends in the U.S., especially on climate and sustainability. What do you think about the fertility of, of the moment now for recruiting more U.S. city, state, and company members to the TDA cause? I mean, as you know, the TDA brings in the three C's, you know, countries, cities, and companies. But when we say cities, we also mean regions. Um, how do you feel about the possibility now of kind of really increasing our outreach in the United States and in North America, maybe in general? I, I know you do things in Canada, with Canada, Canadian provinces and others, but what do you think of this possibility now? So I guess, you know, the first thing that occurs to me is right now, you know, there's a lot of focus on um, the renewed uh, enthusiasm in our, the federal government and the, you know, very active, immediate, let's say immediately active uh, right out of the gate on climate and on climate and transportation and on the potential for infrastructure investments to be part of uh, economic recovery as part of our uh, environmental justice and racial justice efforts. So I would say that in the very short term, the focus of a lot of our uh, states, region, cities is going to be on reconnecting uh, with the, at the federal level or connecting with the Biden administration. Um, and I, I do think that's taking energy and focus. Um, but my hope is that um, that the overall activity associated with the climate efforts, decarbonization activities, is going to drive an interest, you know, in uh, in a higher level of cooperation. And certainly, you know, we already see from the Biden administration the, um, you know, the expression through executive orders, through uh, the establishment of cabinet level positions that. Um, that climate is an international issue, that is an international relations and security issue. Um, and then I think that uh, Secretary Buttigieg also, you know, has uh, climate as a very, very strong piece of the infrastructure agenda. Yeah, and, and I think those signals from the top, I think, could really, I guess, sway um, potential membership increases in the U.S. for the TDA and, and also increase the potential for partnership. I mean, this is something the TDA would take seriously because, I mean, there is a lot of fertile ground in the United States and North America in general. I, I mean, just to see how we can engage and, and, and move in and see what um, opportunities exist um, for really helping to, to support maybe some cities or companies um, in this effort or some state governments as we're talking about here. Um, but that's really good. And, and hopefully, you know, there's some plans, I think, from the Biden administration for engaging at the global level beyond just being part of the Paris Agreement, right? There's yes. hope for an international climate um, conference and all that. So maybe that could be a good place to see what opportunities, opportunities exist. Um, other than that, I mean, in terms of, of California's work in the TDA, it's always been a wonderful thing to have you aboard, Ellen, and to have the state government of California aboard. I mean, there's been a number of times throughout our work where you've connected us with other, with other representatives of state transport departments and, and cities in California. So we've always been grateful to your efforts and your dedication to the TDA. And of course, we'd love to continue to have these conversations with you and your colleagues. And just to keep things growing, um, that's really what it's all about. I, I think there's some some level of hope now for for a better climate future, um, and I'm and I know that California is going to be at the forefront of that, especially in North America. So thank you very much. It's been a really nice time having this chat with you, and and let's see, let's hope for the best and and keep working. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure, Chris. Thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, thanks to you and your colleagues for making it possible. I, I would say stay warm, but you're definitely, wherever you are in California, I, I think you're in Sacramento, right? It's definitely warmer than it is here in New York. So I think I'm warmer, no warmer than you at the moment. That's right. <laughs> I'll say stay, stay healthy, I'll say. Thank you so much. You too, Ellen. All right. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.